you. Now to give us something of Annie Oakley's take on all of this, we have Monica Rico, who is an associate professor of history at Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin, where she's taught since 2001. Her research interests include environmental history, gender history, and the American West, and her book, which no doubt many of us have heard of, is Nature's Nobleman, Transatlantic Masculinities in the 19th Century American West, which came out in 2013. She's currently working on a book-length project about artist Charles Wilson Peale and his family, and she's going to talk today about Annie Oakley performing The New Girl. So, um, first of all, some of you probably know um, Rex Myers and Susan Richards, and uh, I have to thank them, although they're not here, because they introduced me to Jeremy about 10 years ago, and um, Jeremy introduced me to Frank Christensen, so great big thanks to Frank and Jeremy um, for having me here. It's really a pleasure. I'm not going to talk that much, to be honest, about Annie Oakley's take on things. I'm going to actually try to talk a little bit more about how the people who surrounded her um, may have understood or read her performance within the cultural context um, of their time. And in so doing, I want to um, try to provide some context for, um, some additional context for this sort of apparent fascination with girlishness that seems to have been um, part of female performance um, in the Wild West arena. Oops, all right. So um, in some ways, with Oakley, there's kind of this proliferation of images of her. Um, we do have some writings from her. She gave quite a few newspaper interviews. Um, but the actual image of her, in some ways, has kind of floated free from the historical Oakley um, to represent a wide variety of things. So in um, children's books, she's often upheld as a kind of model of um, a talented girl who pursued her dreams. Um, in the, uh, in the, the film with Barbara Stanwyck, um, she's really a romantic heroine. Um, this is a poster from the um, early 90s revival of Annie Get Your Guns. So you have two different theatrical takes on a musical Annie, one from Bernadette Peters um, and the earlier famous one from Ethel Merman. In the 1950s, um, there was a television serial um, featuring an Annie Oakley individual <laughs> who was um, a sheriff of a town who solved crimes, um, wasn't married, but had an invalid kid brother whom she took care of. Um, and this is in addition to various other dime novels, um, programs, pictures, and so on. There's the um, actual historical Annie Oakley. Um, and that image as well is, is a pretty popular kind of um, image when ephemera from the Wild West um, is, is given out to people. So we see some of the kind of key uh, trademarks of her look, which she refined fairly early in her career and then um, kind of kept pretty static throughout that career. So what I'd like to do in the next slide is talk a little bit about what that, what that image was. So Oakley faced several um, kind of challenges as a female performer in the Wild West. Um, one of those challenges was in ensuring that she didn't look too masculine, too um, androgynous. It was important for her to be a feminine, um, a vision of femininity in the arena and to not be seen as um, overly challenging or subverting or undermining gender norms. But at the same time, it was also important for her to be a respectable woman, to be seen as um, not an actress um, or an acrobat or a dancer, all um, kind of roles in entertainment that were associated with sexual immorality. Um, just as Cody often emphasized that the Wild West was really an educational experience and not a show, um, Oakley stressed that her um, performance was really a demonstration of skill rather than um, a piece of showbiz. Now, obviously, you know, that's a claim underneath that there was plenty of entertainment and lots of careful um, construction of a, of a, 
um, neatly paced act that had a climax. But the one of the things that she emphasized was that she um, she really performed her tricks. There wasn't any um, subterfuge or sleight of hand. A lot of um, theater sharpshooters, not not other arena sharpshooters, but theater sharpshooters were known to use various kinds of tricks and ruses to perform um, their stunts. Uh, in the space of the Wild West arena, you couldn't really do that. You actually had to um, kind of <laughs> walk your talk. You had to show that you really could perform these stunts. And so one of the things that Oakley did was take the arena setting and use it to her advantage to really stress this idea that she was um, a respectable woman or a respectable female performing um, a demonstration. And in that way to balance this, um, this quality of femininity while still not being um, perceived as overly putting herself on display in a public space. So the image on the left is a publicity illustration, obviously. And um, one of the things that's noticeable about it as compared to the photograph on the right is the way in which Oakley um, is appeared in stays that are quite tightly laced and that emphasize um, the maturity of her figure. So this is a somewhat more sexualized image of um, Oakley, but if you compare it to, and I took this slide out because I didn't really have time, if you compare it to um, images of dancers and acrobats from the same time period, you can see that this is actually much less sexualized. The image on the right um, is even more, um, uh, is even more in some ways androgynous. Um, Oakley didn't want to wear stays in the arena because they would interfere with her shooting and the ability for her to do her tricks. Um, similarly, that's one reason why she didn't wear really long skirts. Um, but it was important that her legs not be bare or seem bare, that they were covered, and so she wore these kind of leggings and gaiters over her shoes. And then she added some key touches, the long hair flowing down her back, which became a trademark, um, the Stetson, it's important for women to wear Stetsons as well. Um, and in this publicity picture, um, various medals that she had won, although she didn't usually wear those in the ring. And then, of course, various um, guns. So what's she doing here? Is, she, is, this, is this a sort of proto-feminist picture? Or, um, or is this in some ways um, a vision of petite domesticity? Well, offstage, in the kind of backstage area of the uh, Wild West, I think it's probably fair to say that Oakley really did perform a kind of domesticity. In her tent, she would serve tea to reporters, offer them cookies, um, do fine needlework. Um, journalists commented on her, quote, decidedly pretty and winsome face, sweet and gentle manners, her quiet and ladylike ways, and her soft girlish voice. Um, and in the arena, and remember, like you couldn't, there was no dialogue. It was pretty much all sort of body language when you're watching this little, this little figure out there in the center of the arena. In the arena, some of the things that Oakley did were, um, again, quite feminine. She was known for sort of skipping around, for tossing kisses at the audience, for sort of stamping her foot and tossing her head when she would miss a shot. And so she really performed this um, comic but playful, but also quite um, in some ways girlish and, um, and youthful image in the arena. One that um, wasn't sexualized or seductive or in, in other terms, um, one that wasn't overly mannish. And in this way, she mirrored her act mirrored a cultural figure that was just coming into visibility in the 1880s and 1890s, a new idea for girls. Um, this, uh, the, the adolescent girl in some ways kind of comes into sharper focus in the 1880s, partly as a result of um, physicians and educators' concerns about child development that drew from ideas about evolution, um, and ideas about how organisms develop. There was a lot of fascination with kind of the ways in which 
the development trajectory of individuals from infancy to adulthood kind of mirrored the developmental trajectory of the human race as a whole. So just as little tiny children were considered to be kind of savage, so too there were actual savages, quote unquote savages, who were supposedly acting like small children who didn't have self-restraint, who were overly emotional, just like little children. And so adolescents, um, for educators in, and physicians in this period was more and more seen as this critical stage for the development of um, character and morality that would be um, not necessarily as Christianized or um, as, as religious as earlier notions of character formation had been, but more dedicated towards creating individuals who could function in modern industrial culture and sustain certain dominant ideals of gender and family and nationhood. So um, what I'm going to do next is look a little bit at this image of girlhood, both in the United Kingdom and in the United States. Um, and we'll see how this image of the new girl kind of surrounded Oakley's act and conferred upon it a richer meaning than it would have had without that context. Okay, so here are some girls fencing around 1905. Um, Rodine School was a, um, a boarding school for middle class girls in, um, in England, it's in southern England. Um, fencing was um, encouraged for teenage girls. At this point, it was sort of more like dance than an actual system of self-defense because guns kind of tended to make fencing obsolete as a, as a sort of combat system. So, um, so there was nothing sort of worrisome about girls learning defense. It was meant to teach coordination and grace and quickness on one's feet. Um, so fencing, um, croquet, tennis, rowing, swimming, skating, all of these outdoors activities were encouraged for the new girl. Teachers and educators told parents that they shouldn't keep their girls cooped up at home um, endlessly doing needlework and housework, that they should encourage them to get outside to, quote, enjoy the free use of their limbs, like that, limbs are being used, um, that, that girls should actually learn, quote, self-reliance, and even an element of competition provided that competition was not um, channeled into overly aggressive forms of athletics. So for example, um, field hockey was okay, but rugby was kind of a little bit too physical. You didn't want girls actually like colliding and tackling with each other, but it was okay to have them competing. And so this was very much in contrast to an earlier notion of girlhood where um, girls were sort of expected to um, learn how to control themselves to interior spaces and to restrain, their, like physically restrain themselves and close their bodies down and kind of occupy um, less, less space. Now that said, the new athletic girl um, wasn't necessarily meant to um, go out and compete in public. Athletics were meant to be um, pursued among friends, at school, in family outings. Sports were um, envisioned as a way for um, girls to be comradely with boys their own age um, in, and to pursue a kind of friendship that would eventually, it was thought, you know, kind of uh, down along the line, turn into heterosexual romance or marriage, but it was quite important in the kind of Darwinian thinking of the time that middle class white girls not kind of overly, not mature sexually overly early. That was perceived to be um, something that was atavistic, that would be a throwback, that would not be part of civilization. So instead, girls were, um, ex the girls in this new ideal were expected to kind of blend home and public spaces um, and places like um, tennis courts, um, the school, um, hockey field, and eventually to be able to enjoy um, things like shooting or tennis or golf with their husbands. And so th the long-term view was that um, athletics would be a way for women to be healthier mothers and to produce 
um, vigorous children for the future of, of white people, basically, in the world, for the future of um, the empire, and also um, as a way of strengthening companionate marriage and, um, and family. So here's um, just another image of the kind of um, ways in which sports for girls were meant to kind of balance um, a, a kind of athleticism, but also a certain amount of delicacy. So another aspect of the new girl that emerges in this period are um, books that are written specifically for girls that are a little bit different from the books that had appeared um, mid-century books by people like Louisa May Alcott. In um, these new books for girls, um, families were almost never there. So whereas earlier books envisioned girls kind of coming to maturity and achieving their character through the tutelage of a mothering figure, in these books, often girls were on their own, parents were absent, they weren't even orphans being adopted. They were kind of really, like, they were in school or they um, had been stranded by shipwrecks or things like that. And in these, um, in these books, girls were pictured as actively taking part in adventurous pursuits, rescuing someone in danger, sur surviving shipwreck. Very often they were um, shown uh, shooting, not to kill people, but to um, often um, get food or defend livestock, um, or um, in some cases just to sort of scare away dangerous people. A lot of these books in the British context tended to focus on imperial spaces. Um, and many of the ones, but, but a lot of them also showed girls in boarding <laughs> schools as well. Okay, so the last sort of aspect of the new girl image that I'm going to talk about are girl guides and girl scouts. The girl guides are the sort of British and British imperial version of the scouting program for girls in the United States. Um, now, it's not that, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the scouts modeled themselves on Annie Oakley. Um, chronologically, scouts and guides come after Annie Oakley, but I'm not saying they looked at Oakley and said, oh, that's what we should look like. It's more that if you wanted to come up with a comfortable, practical kind of outfit that was also still feminine and respectable, you might very well come up with something like this. But what I do think is possible is that for girls who participated in guiding and scouting, the experiences of, um, of teamwork and leadership and outdoors adventure, um, the chance to um, exercise initiative and develop some el element of self-reliance um, echoed the messages that could have been conveyed by Oakley, not only in her arena performances, but also in the interviews that she gave where she encouraged women to learn how to shoot, where she um, promoted bicycling as a positive activity for women, and where she um, extolled the joys of camping and um, outdoors recreation. So in conclusion, um, it's not I don't, I don't want to say, okay, here's Annie Oakley and here's some other pictures and wow, aren't they similar because they are similar, but that's not necessarily much of an argument. It's more that we, I think it's useful to think about how um, Oakley's image provided um, something that was kind of, something that was sort of good to think with if you were a young woman trying to figure out who you were. The space between childhood and adulthood, the, the borderland, if you will, between childhood and adulthood, um, could be seen as a, as a time of risk and danger for young women. And even in our own time, there's a lot of, if you think about books like Surviving Ophelia or concerns about um, girls with eating disorders, um, not pursuing their interests, there's still this sense that um, that adolescence is a risky time and then that, that risk is gendered in different ways for, um, for boys and for girls. Oakley's performance um, and the context surrounding this performance could work together to um, produce a story where girls could imagine themselves um, not as marginal to the show, but at the center of it, not as um, captives, or people who needed to be rescued, 
but as the rescuers, as the people who could save the day. Um, and I think that that is one of the stories, um, maybe one of the less obvious stories, but I think if we pay attention, we can see it unfolding that the Wild West um, had to tell. Thank you.